that would certainly be one of my takeaways as well is that really grew me or I fell in love with endurance sport. Like I love just going out there and everything just eventually disappears. And you don't know exact that exact moment of when you just stop thinking about things. But once you do, you can just keep going for for hours and I feel like there's a parallel with work ethic or certain situations too where I just like that grind. Welcome Dave Hackworthy. What's going on Andy? Yeah I'm so excited to have you on the pod. Yeah thanks for having me. I was thinking this morning I'm like how long have we known each other and I was thinking back to I feel like it was around like 2014. When did you start selling real estate? It would have been right around yeah 14. Back in 13, I started with creative and it's kind of a jack of all trades, running warranty. And then I was sitting in the models on the weekends. And then in 14, I went full-time sales and you were at my model like at least once a month. Yeah. Like, and I'm right, like, wait, who is this? Guy? Okay. So, so right now you're uh, a sales representative for creative homes, right? Which is a family owned business. Yep. Right? Yep. So my brother started and, and owns creative homes. I run the sales on our custom division now, which is called Creative Custom Homes. And so between myself and a couple other individuals, we can build on one of our uh, architectural series lots in Hills of Troy or Hidden Meadows of Lake Elmo, or we can build on your lot, help you find a lot, build anywhere, really within a hour radius of the Twin Cities. Sweet, sweet. So, so you got the long answer to a short question. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> So, as a true salesman would always do, it, yeah. right? So, I don't know, uh, <laughs> better a salesman than a politician. It's my so, first podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so you grew up in the new construction business, right? Your dad owned a new, con- like a larger new construction company. Yep, I did. Um, Tell my, me about that. Yeah. So, my dad he originally started in uh, the commercial space, building commercial buildings, precast buildings. Uh, eventually moved into land development and then uh, multifamily. So built a, a large number of uh, townhomes uh, every year in mostly the, the East Metro, or I guess, I mean, the entire Twin Cities. And they topped out of around, you know, I think 400 units a year. So, yeah, it, it, it really was. So I, I grew up with a front row seat to that and started working for him when I was, gosh, I don't know, nine very young on the on the field ops crew so you know he dropped me off at uh the shop i'd go out with the guys uh, at nine years old it was at when i was nine you know my grandpa actually worked for him on the field side as well so at that time i was probably going out with my grandpa it's hard to remember the exact age but it had to have been 11 you know, 11 12 or 13 i was definitely rolling with the boys on the field ops crew you wow. know stopping getting mountain dew code reds putting things in your body that you just you just shouldn't yeah and mowing i used to have to put a brick on the lawnmower because i didn't weigh enough and so i was that young working on the field ops crew and what do you think was like a unique like unique perspectives that kind of fast forward way later in life that since you got to grow up around all of that what did dad teach you certainly work ethic and i mean we were a entrepreneurial family so we're just constantly surrounded by that i think we just always have a look at things with the perspective of a business mindset which can be a blessing and a curse Mm -hmm. you got to find that right balance and takeaways is certainly i mean my dad was in development and building a few hundred units a year you really had to be in front of it from a land position and unfortunately watched some real carnage happen which I believe everything kind of happens for a reason and looking at where everything is now, it's all good, but got a lot of respect for him. 2008 for developers Yep, was like for people that took it on the chin, the hardest would definitely be real estate developers in 2008 when that crash happened. Yeah. Right. Because land values went down like literally like 80 or 90 percent. It was almost worthless. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, pretty much zero. They went down... 80, 90 percent, and then they still weren't moving. So you have an interesting thing about yourself that you're an athlete, right? And yeah. You're big into biking. Can yeah. You tell me about that, that journey for you. So it would have been high school, grew up playing hockey. Uh, I know Luke Steele's been on your podcast. Yeah. Luke was actually my hockey coach growing up. Really? Uh, okay. Got all kinds of stories with that. And then 
one of my buddies he got into bike racing like cycling i always tell people they're like oh motocross i'm like no like pedal bike like lance armstrong and they're like oh okay and so started doing that in high school had uh some success started traveling around the country for it um eventually led to racing on the u.s national team so i got to go race over in europe belgium germany netherlands race the world championships for the united states in the under 23 category in the czech republic yeah just had a great experience with it and eventually hung it up to focus on other things but it it afforded me i mean an outlet for my competitive nature and the ability to travel around on somebody else's dime all around the country and all around the world how cool is that you get to see all over the world that's pretty cool on someone else's dime <laughs> right like sure. and you get, yeah that is what a unique ex- i can't imagine what do you have like takeaways now years later when you look back at that with the coaches and the mentors and the people that you had around you at that time like what are the big key takeaways that you now years later are like oh wow i learned so much yeah i would say i mean the first one was the first time i went over there you basically give your plane ticket i think i was maybe 16 17 years old you land in belgium and you're just told like hey someone will be there and you're like what if my my plane's delayed what if this or that and they're like someone will they'll be there they'll they'll find you and so it's like, okay, you just roll with it. And I land there and don't have a, you know, it's back when you, you can't just turn your cell phone on international and sure enough, somebody's there. So I guess the lesson learned there is just kind of rolling with it and you become a product of like your environment, get comfortable being uncomfortable and being exposed to that from a very young age is one of my big takeaways in, in that sphere. And then when you're just in it, like when I was racing, it was just my normal, right? And so when you put yourself in spheres around people or in situations where expectations are very high while it feels normal in your head it's actually pushing you like well beyond your competition or other people yeah you are who you hang with for sure yeah so like if you when you were going out biking for a day like how long like how many miles would you put on i'm less about my it was less about miles more about time when you're doing what we would call base miles in the in the spring season targeting to have 30 hours on the bike a week and then on the weekends you're doing long days you're doing like back to back you know six to eight hour days on the bike which is probably just over 100 miles sounds like you just hurt my ass i don't know like that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) probably yeah like first yeah Uh, but that would certainly be one of my takeaways as well as that really kind of groom me or I fell in love with endurance sport like I love just going out there and everything just eventually disappears and you don't know exact that exact moment of when you just stop thinking about things but once you do you can just keep going for for hours and I feel like there's a parallel with work ethic or certain situations too where I just I just like that grind and I guess it doesn't even register as a grind in my in my mind i love it i like to be in it yeah the grit i I would think that the grit of if you're facing a huge hill or just a really tough spot and having to push beyond the pain did you get that kind of pain like when you're in that style of biking because i'm not a biker so i don't really understand like is there pain like is there a point where you're like this is freaking hard yeah i mean definitely on the training side like you're like ow 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 you know you kind of keep going but you're also just kind of accustomed to it the pain really now if you're racing what i used to always tell myself my head is like i don't need to beat a guy by a mile but so long as i can just keep it in my mind that this guy's going through the exact same thing that i am right now and it's a mind game who can hold out for just a little bit longer like as soon as he breaks like i just have to put out power for like a millisecond and I win. (laughs) And so that was definitely a a mindset where it's worth the pain. You push through it. I just have to break this guy and then I'll win. Isn't that sales? Like for like when you're winning the deal sometimes? It definitely. Like win the the next client where you're like, definitely is one more time when the other person stops following up. For sure. Yeah. So you definitely have that, like that competitive nature. And when you are competitive, it, it helps so much in this field. And then there's that next progression, right? Where, all right, I no longer want to 
just beat this guy in a sprint. Now I do want to beat him by a mile Mm -hmm. (laughs) and taking the next steps to go in and do that. I get very competitive when I, when I think back what I just said there, a better way to say it is I want to beat the competition by a mile, not just to beat him, but to provide an experience that's better ultimately for the customer in this space. And when it comes to athletics or something like that, just setting myself apart from everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah, winners just want to win. For sure. That's what the name <laughs> of the game is, right? Winners just want to win. So you have now been in real estate sales for a little over 10 years. Yep. Right? And, you, and, you know, our journey together was, you know, starting off seeing you sell two hundred, $250,000 single family homes that were new. Brand new. Which yeah. is like wild yeah. for us to like think about now. Oh, yeah. And these are nice houses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like... Which would now be like, that same house could be 600 grand. Oh, easy. Yeah. yeah. We had one big red. I mean, all three levels finished. I think there was three fireplaces in it. Deck. And <laughs> yeah. it was at two ninety nine nine. Yeah. Pretty yeah. wild to, to think of and see how the, the market has changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you went from selling that style of home with creative to selling, you've seen you sell your way through different developments to now the custom home side, yep. which is... So creative custom isn't just you client comes to you to build a custom home. You guys build the custom home and sell it, correct? Yeah. We'll spec out. We'd refer to them as quick moving homes within our, our communities that fit the, like the price point. And they're usually about an, you know, acre plus type lot sizes. And then we'll, we'll build for customers as well. Cool. What are they like? What's the the common trend? So it's summer 2024. Like, what are the big trends that you're seeing in houses? Especially, you're kind of like uh, upper bracket for a lot of these houses in the Twin Cities would be considered upper bracket, like kind of 750 and up. Is that yeah, a fair? Yep, for sure. Fair price up. To and even on the million. yeah the production side of of creative, like we really found a niche of being you know a step above your national production builder. By providing the unmatched customer experience, uh, unrivaled plan options, personalization. So we niched our way into that market with those uniques. And on the custom side, we're definitely on the upper end. This last Prada Homes, we had one in Wisconsin in the Prada at 850, which was more of our our value build in this category. And then in Lake Elmo, we had one at a, a million seven. Mm-hmm. So what are you seeing that like the design trends on these upper bracket custom homes that is maybe different than five or eight years ago? Is there some some things that you're seeing that really stand out and people really want? Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing, I mean, golf sims are incredibly popular. We're seeing those spaces kind of replace the the sport court. We're still seeing people, you know, ask and, and want for a sport court. But I would say demand is a little bit down there and we're in the shifting period. Main level entertainment space, main level uh, wet bars, I call them prep pantries, where you have the pantry behind the kitchen or next to the kitchen where you have plenty of storage, but also separate sink, maybe a beverage fridge, countertop, somewhere when you're entertaining, you can go, you know, make some cocktails or make some drinks for your guests and not have it be on your, your kitchen island. Make the mess back there. For sure. Right. And then yeah. you keep the kitchen, the showpiece. Big garages as well. I see that. It seems like a lot of the houses you guys will be building will be four car garages yep. for the bigger homes. Four wide and, I mean, then sometimes even double deep. Really? Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, the footage and to add that space in the garage, if you have the space on the lot to do so, I think you get immense value out of, I mean, the cost to build a detached garage or a pole building, you know, these days have also essentially doubled. So. Mm-hmm. It's a nice space for for people to add it there. And from a resale standpoint, very, very solid. Yeah. I see uh, another trend I see is transitioning from all white. Like there, it was like, you know, I feel like we're going to look back and be like 2015 now. So it's, yeah. it's like white wall, white and gray. You know, now the white. Yeah, trim, gray is definitely out. That's gone. But it seems like now kitchens is more natural woods. Yeah, it's coming yeah, back. we traded white enamel for white oak. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's so. Yep, we're seeing the wood tones come in. They're still on the cooler side, but we are starting to see some of the warmer tones um, come back in. Not so dark like the Craftsman era, like when we first met. Yeah, you know, 2012 to like probably 16. 
If everybody remembers the hand scraped engineer, wood floors, super dark, super hard to clean. <laughs> or like you walk on them one time, you see everything, high contrast, very dark woods, you know, combined with white. So we're not getting back to that place, but we're starting to see, you know, like the walnut tones outside of just the white oak. The white oak is just so hot right now. Yeah. I'm seeing that. Yeah, no honey oak. White oak. Right? Like, yeah. you know, yeah, when people hear oak, they're like, Ugh. yeah. It's like, no, not honey. No, right? it's all, like, yeah. White house, black windows, white oak. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that, that's super, super cool. So, what else are you seeing that is changing on when, when customers are coming to you? What are you seeing that's another 2024 trend? Is there, are they taking more time? Yeah. So, what I've seen in kind of the custom space or to circle back on what we talked about earlier is with our customers, they can come to us with a, a plan set that they put together with an, uh, with an architect or if they want to work with us on plan design, we can design something totally custom. But what we find that the demand is, is that 90% of our customers, at least 90%, they want to work off of something that they can look at, see, feel, touch. So we'll work off of something that we've built in the past, something in our portfolio. It might not be on our website, but we've built it. And ideally, most of the time I can get them into the house, send the past owners out to dinner, and then they can walk through it, feel the spaces, and then we can modify it from there. This is huge. That right there alone, on the mortgage side, I can already see and feel and talk to clients that it's like, all right, I want to build this dream Rambler, dream two-story, yeah. and then I don't get a chance to see it. So that it's like, I'm just, I just have this vision. I think of what it's going to look like when you guys have so many models or spec homes and you can be like, we can build that exact house yep. on your land. Yep. And I mean, it's one thing if you're going to go spend a million bucks and you have many million and you're going to spend a million bucks off of a, you know, a black and white set of plans. But for most people, I mean, this is the biggest investment of their life. And to go spend the most money that they've ever spent on a home, just on a on a, a hope that these black and white drawings are going to match what their expectations are in their head, it's a huge risk for the majority of people. So by just being, to get them into a home so they can feel that space, it's a closer for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's also why the quick move-in homes go so well. Yeah. Because you're like, I see, this may not be exactly what I want, but I can see exactly what I get right here. Yep. It is ready today and they'll usually take a contingent offer which seems like not that big of a deal right for people but yep. that is why i think new construction is the area of growth for the next couple of years yep. is that contingent is a big deal for the financing side people don't want two mortgages no yeah no and it, it is interesting i mean coming from pre-covid to now there's definitely that huge shift of people wanting something done ready to go we used to see a lot more of Hey, I'm spending 800 grand. I'm spending a million bucks. I want it how I want it. And now it's, it's kind of the opposite. They're going, gosh, I'm spending this kind of money. And I got to go through this stress for 10 to 12 months. No, thanks. Yeah. That's a good, so you bring up a good point in terms of, so if a client comes to you and say, Hey, we're building our dream home, right? We saw, we, we went out on the parade of homes or they don't, you know, you don't need to go on the parade of homes to see your houses. The model, most of the models are open on the weekends. Yeah. So they can go look at one of the houses and say, now, Dave, I want to build this type of house with you. What is it from the time that they meet with you to go to closing? What, what is realistic? Like that they're actually going to be in the house from the first conversation. Depends. <laughs> but funny. I would say... You know, the, the bookends are eight to 12 months. So we can also take one of our creative homes production floor plans and build that offsite. And so if we can take something off the shelf, we have the pricing tight, we can move through the upfront process relatively quickly with the customer, you know, we could hit a, an eight month time frame If they already have the lot, it's a straightforward lot. That would be, that'd be running. Most of the time it's 10 to 10 to 12 with, uh, you know, a four month upfront process and construction time of six to seven months, depending mm -hmm. on the build. Which is pretty quick. I see builders really dragging things out right now. And that price range to nine to 12 months, it seems like. And something I've been impressed by you guys is someone, if they pick a floor plan that they like, you guys can price it fast. 
in pricing. I have multiple clients that we're dealing with with builders right now that just to get the initial price is such a pain. Or they say one number and they come back around yep. and the initial number that is told to them and the actual bid amount isn't even in the same world. It's right. so like, hey, we're going to bid. Yeah. We think it's going to be 500. And they come back and they say, oh, it's seven. And the client's like, it's not even in my price range. Yep. Right? Like, now you've just wasted three months of my life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, it, we, yeah, we, we know it because we've been there. I mean, we've been that builder before. We've, we've made those mistakes. We've learned from them. It's probably been eight years since we used to do it that way. Like the classic play, the playbook on the custom side is always, hey, third party architect. Let's sit down, design the home in your dreams. We all spend probably three months doing it after each revision tweak. We don't have any pricing yet. And then there's the big reveal. We get it back. We blow your budget by 200 grand. That was pre-COVID. Now I'm hearing stories of budgets being blown by 500, a million bucks. I mean, people <laughs> going in with a budget of a million two and getting a bid back at, at two. And then they're like, well, this is just the start. What about the change orders? Okay. You then go through a price saving exercise like, okay, we said that we're going to put everything in. Now let's, let's comb it back and let's get back on budget. You go try to save 200 grand and the bids come back. You save like 50 <laughs> and the customer's demoralized. They don't even know if they want to build a home or buy a home. You know, they'll either get pushed and buy something existing at that point or they might just stay put. So we changed our process, you know, probably eight years ago to this, hey, let's work off of something within our portfolio. We can keep cost in mind through the plan design process because we know what they are. We've built it recently. And so we can turn pricing quickly and check the boxes for layout, fit and finish and timing of the customer. I think uh, one really cool financing option that you guys are willing to throw out a, out a lot of homes, even some of the creative custom stuff is the buy downs. Yeah, right. definitely been a strong tool in the builder toolbox. Yeah, two one buy down or three two one buy down. For those that don't know, that means you can reduce your rate on a three two one. That's the big boy, right? Oh, if yeah. you're, let's just say rates are seven percent today, you can start off at four percent for year one, then five percent year two, then six percent year three. Then the final year, you go back to seven, and either that just helped you step into the property, or the market has reset itself, which is really cool. It's like a way that the builder can actually give you money. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because if the market does drop sooner and any balance that's left is a refund yeah. into the principal balance. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, like I, I like to say, you can use some of that money and get like a free refi. Yeah. Right? Like if it costs you five grand to refi or whatever it is, and you Absolutely. have five grand left in the account... There you go. Just offset the cost of that to get the market rate. Yep. It's pretty cool. It, you guys were ahead of the trend cool. on that. Yeah. We were ag ag aggressive on it early. We saw the value in it. And it's interesting, you know, I'm sure you, you were well aware of it at the same time too, where it, it is this great product given the, the circumstances, given the condition, you know, versus a, a permanent buy down where, you know, high expense and you're going to refi at some point anyways. And overcoming the objection of, people think that you're trying to sell them something or like, it's just kind of gimmicky, right? Because it adjusts each year, but it was great to see the market eventually uh, adapted because the value is absolutely there. We were yeah. a huge believer in it. Like a, like an example on a $500,000 home where people are looking at these huge price drops on say like a two, one buy down. It's like, all right, you could just take that reduction in price it's going to save you like 60 bucks a month. Yeah. Or do you want the huge monthly savings for the first couple of years? I feel like 90% of the people are like, I'll take the big monthly savings now. Yeah. And I, yeah. I like the fact that it gives you options. Like it's like, hey, big monthly savings or an opportunity presents itself. We refi and the money's not just gone. You know, it pays down that principle. Yeah. It bigger the loans, bigger right? the savings. Too. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's huge. So you guys are ahead of the trend on the financing. Side yeah. Of things. And going back to like the price point question, I mean, we've seen the market really hold up above a million five, which is really kind of interesting. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think that under certain market conditions that people might be pulling back and a little bit more conservative. But in the luxury market, we have far more strength 
over a million five than you know between a million one and a million three. I think it's pretty obvious to me because if you pay attention to the stock market at all, most of the people in that price range, they're either cash or they're putting a huge amount of money down. Yep. And the rate doesn't really matter to yep. them as much. Right. Yep. It's a lifestyle choice. Yep. And they just usually, a lot of them are business owners, executives or whatever it is. Yep. And they just had a hell of a run. Right. Like COVID for a lot of those people, that five year run for most of them, quite honestly. Oh, yeah. It's a can, double. Yeah. They killed it. <laughs> And yeah. their net worth went way up, whether it was in their home, yep. stock market, right, income. Yep. They just, they had a good run. You know, and inflation for a lot of people is bad, but inflation for the wealthy, yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, pr- like, I'm pretty sure they're currently still running. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah stock so we'll market's up like 25% in the last year. So, uh, so that group has made a lot of money. So then they're yep. willing to spend it. Yep. Right? And... If you look at the wealthiest generation is the boomers so so they're sitting on just an insane amount of money right now yeah. and they're willing to spend it yeah and yeah. not just on themselves yeah yeah Get the greatest transfer of wealth in our country's history is happening it's right starting now. yeah yeah and so we're starting to see that trickle in too yeah where the families are helping the kids yeah kids. i mean especially if a parent has the means uh they can't swallow the idea of a kid paying eight percent interest they'll just buy it cash and they'll either play bank or or you know the, if the kids are going to inherit it at some point anyways like we are seeing some parents purchase houses for for their kids cool so where do you where do you see the next year going strength i mean coming into the election we've already seen it with the start of this year we know that you know post covid the annual sales volume in new construction is making up the uh, low supply on the existing side. And so I think that we'll continue to to see that strength. We'll see what the Fed actually does with the, the interest rates. If they do start to come down, I mean, I don't think the show is going to restart to the point that it did in, in COVID, but things will get hot. So I'm very optimistic. I saw a stat that 25% of all sales in the Twin Cities Metro were new construction. Yeah. Yeah, I was really surprised to to read that. Yeah. I saw. I can't remember when I saw the stat, but it was something like annually, pre-COVID, new construction made up like 11, 10, 11% of annual sales. And post-COVID, it's like 34%. Yeah. You guys are in a position to win just because of that interest rate that we lock that we were talking about. All yeah. Those people don't want to sell their house. Right. For if sure. I got two and a half or three percent, I don't want to sell my house and get seven. That's yeah. the reality of the world. So for your guys' industry, it's going to prop it up for yeah. years. I literally think it's going to be years. Yeah. I think you guys are going to have a two or a three year run at this right now. You know, can you look beyond that? It's kind of, kind of hard to yeah. see for, the crystal I, ball. Yeah. I'm not going to make the prediction beyond that, but. Yeah, it's just with the with the rates, it gets hot and it gets hot quick. And then what we see is the inventory, like the new construction inventory gets gobbled up. And then that pushes prices up too. We saw a little bit of it this spring. So I think we'll just continue to see that as as interest, interest rates fluctuate a little bit. Cool. So uh, what do you think that you're particularly good at when you're working with your client? Why have you always been like, if... If the handcuffs are taken off of you, I always feel like you have been, you would be the top creative sales rep, but it hasn't been your only job. Yeah. So yeah. Like why? Well, I, I mean, I have been top creative sales rep. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. Why are you cutting me down like this, Andy? This is my first podcast. Take it easy on me. (laughs) Uh, But yeah. Why? Like, what do you think is like your particular traits that you have that has helped with that? Yeah, Coming I think from like a think about it from a realtor, not the consumer. Right? Yeah, we're talking a realtor watching this, and like, what is Dave doing that they can implement in their own business? Uh, first, I would say is just being comfortable, being uncomfortable, if you will, or asking a lot of questions. And when I say comfortable, being uncomfortable, like you just always have to close. That's just, I had a mentor when I first got into sales that was kind of, you know, the old school, new construction. This is how you, this is how you sell. And you always close like period. And I was 22 and 
people thought I was 17. I just tell my brother owned the company. They're like, how old's your brother? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I'm like going, gosh, these people, I, I, I don't know. It's all in your head, right? Are you going to ask the closing question? And I remember just asking like, hey, what do you guys think about moving forward with this today and securing this home site and, and locking into your pricing for your build and thinking that I was never going to get a yes and just waiting for the no. And then they're like, that sounds great. And they pull out a checkbook, which I didn't know they had with them. And so that experience has forever taught me, like, you always ask. So I had one the other week, guy, open house. I probably use a hundred times as many words as this guy on a daily basis. He's very direct. And I'm not jiving with him. I'm like, what, what do you think of the house? He's like, I like it. I'm like, okay, do you want to buy it? He's like, yes. <laughs> you're like the easiest close of all time, but you yeah, had to. It's, but you had to close. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, so simple but so difficult, and it's just asking that question every time and being comfortable in that space where you feel like you're you're bombing or you you shouldn't ask it or that you're not allowed to ask it yet. It's just to ask it with genuine intent and really to to serve that individual because if you don't ask it and they actually do want the house depending on their personality, they might walk out. Like you could be doing them a disservice by not just trying to extract that information. I agree because what happens if they thought they leave and they think they have plenty of time and yeah. it was their dream home yeah. and you just didn't present the idea that someone might come in tomorrow and buy this house. Yeah. And now you just missed. It was like, you know, next to mom's house or whatever, right? Like, yeah, you, you don't know. Yeah. And you just missed it because they thought oh, I got time. I would, I would say that. And then I'm naturally an incredibly curious person. I'm also like a squirrel. I can only imagine how this podcast is going to turn out. <laughs> but so Over I there. naturally oh. just yeah. want to extract information. I want to get to know you both because I have genuine interest in you, but I love like perspective and, you know, looking inward too to be like, Oh, Hey, what's this person's story? What are they going through? What's their situation? Comparing it to my own and being like, Oh yeah, cool. We're all going through this stuff together. And so being naturally curious, extracting that information helps me help them. And then I'm a natural problem solver. And so as I get that information from a, a customer, I'll then solve with, you know, my property being the solution. So a plus B plus C, C is my property and a plus B is either their needs or wants or their pain points in their current living situation. And so it, it comes from a genuine place of just wanting to help them. And if I have something to do that or a, a solution to it, I will. Cool. So if someone's looking to look at options with you right now, kind of transitioning. Uh, so if they're saying, that I'm interested in building a house, right? Or interested in some of these spec homes, they would come directly to you at Creative Homes. Yeah. Correct? Yep. All right, well, we'll tag you, they can, you know, here. So they they communicate directly with you to be able to get to home priced out or to look at options. Yep, we have a very easy, easy process, you know, to take care of our buyer. We have a refundable deposit to get the process started. And I tell everybody, even in the event this doesn't work out, I can promise you the amount of time that you're going to spend with us, which is going to be a few hours, you will leave either on track to build your dream home or armed with information that is going to give you the right perspective or direction for what you're going to do going forward, whether that's looking at your lot, uh, build costs, pricing, uh, timing, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I can say, you know, at this point, I've financed hundreds of creative homes. I don't think anybody in America has financed more homes than, than myself for creative, so I'm proud of that. Uh, and uh, you guys do follow through with what you say you're going to do, and your processes are some of the best on being able to actually fulfill what your promises to the client, to be able to close on time to not have all these major warranty issues afterwards, which is something that people don't think about, right? That no, yeah. you can get in the house and all of a sudden it falls apart, yeah. right? It's kind of like the, it's it's not the used car taillight warranty that once you get to closing, it's, you know, no, see you later, no. you guys don't treat your clients like that. So it's 
Really appreciate it. You're a professionally run organization. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And same with you, you know, and you're asking me all these questions. I like to make a little plug for you. I mean, you came into my model over and over again. I'm like, who's this Andy Burton guy? And then finally we get to work together. Uh, or I'm like, oh, I'm like, okay, I'll send, you know, go talk to Andy. We did our first deal. And uh, you want to talk about process. You got process. Yeah. <laughs> and it's my favorite thing to inform, you know, any customers or clients on that are working with you is like, hey, Andy is set up between him and his team. Like you can sleep easy. You're taken care of. So appreciate your process and follow through as well. Cool. Well, thank you very, very much, man. So thanks for taking the time to be on the pod. I really appreciate it. For sure. You bet. All right. <laughs>